The magical girl genre was one of those things that, when I was a kid, I just sort of accepted as having always been a thing, because from my perspective, it was. By the time I was old enough to process it, anime was already being imported to America and easily accessible via cable TV on channels like the Kids WB and Cartoon Network. And anime like Sailor Moon, Cardcaptors, and Mew Mew Power were airing right alongside cartoons like Powerpuff Girls, Winx, and Totally Spies. And although these versions were heavily edited and censored, it wasn't long before the internet made fan-subbed anime easily accessible, and we were able to watch these stories as they had been originally intended to be told. Actually, fun fact, when I was a kid, I wasn't quite old enough to have figured out how to navigate the internet and find these fan-subbed episodes myself. But somehow, my dad got a hold of entire seasons of these fan-subbed episodes of Sailor Moon that were burned onto like a handwritten CD, which I would watch in our home computer room after school. And I loved it, and I watched them religiously, but this is legit what they looked and sounded like. It was dark times to be an anime fan, my dude. But because of these fan subs, I had access to the story in all its uncensored, bit-crushed glory a lot earlier than most people. Which made me realize, magical girls are super fucking gay. And while in the process of doing several of these deep dive magical girl videos, I realized I've never asked myself, why are they so gay? What is it exactly about magical girls that is so appealing to LGBT plus creators and viewers? Is it just that pretty girls fighting crime in the name of love and justice is deeply and irrevocably sapphic? Maybe! There certainly are a lot of sapphic characters and relationships that pop up in different Magical Girl series, and most of my favorite Magical Girl series have at least one canonic lesbian character or couple. But are there actually more instances of sapphic characters than in, say, the slice of life or cooking genre? And if so, then why? Well, let's find out! But before we do that, as a disclaimer, I'm going to use the term lesbian a lot in this video. Just assume anytime I do, it's under the sapphic umbrella, which generally includes women loving women, bi women, trans women, and non-binary people. And just in general, I do tend to use gay and queer as reclaimed umbrella terms. So as long as we're all on the same page about that, we can move right along. Well, if we look at the narrative structure and core themes of the magical girl genre, there are a lot of reasons why it may naturally be appealing to sapphic women. While the magical girl genre isn't strictly binary, as there are plenty of magical boys, gender fluid, and non-binary people, the majority of magical girls are, well, unsurprisingly, girls. And when your story revolves around a cast that are all the same gender, then all of the focus, dialogue, character development, story, and drama are going to revolve around that cast and the relationships they form together. And while most of those relationships are going to be platonic, that doesn't mean all of them will be. Therefore, due to sheer numbers, there's going to be an increase in the likelihood of queer themes, simply because characters of the opposite sex are less involved. This principle commonly applies to stories where there's some narrative reason for a gender-segregated cast, like being set in an all-girls or all-boys school, a sports team, or during war. But this can also overlap with the, um, the 1950s brand of misogynistic writing that's been dug so deep it accidentally circles right back around into homoromanticism. Like, there's no narrative reason why the story puts all the focus on the male characters and their relationships and barely includes any female characters in a way that's actually substantial, other than that the author just doesn't care or doesn't know how to write women. And in that case, then obviously the audience is going to become more invested in the main relationship you've spent days or months or sometimes actual real-time years cultivating instead of a hastily tacked on love interest mentioned in a single line as an afterthought. Anyway, a typical Magical Girl series usually has a main cast of all girls, with let's say one male love interest for the heroine which leaves anywhere from two to four to nine other characters with an unaddressed lack of romantic subplot, which an author can handle a couple of different ways. Most of the time, they just won't get a romantic subplot, which is totally fine. If every character had a romantic subplot, it would lead to being tangled up in a love dodecahedron, which not every story is going to have room for. Or, as mentioned before, the writer can either invent or upgrade a minor, often disposable side character of the opposite sex for one of the main characters to fall in love with. 
the problem posed with this method is that these characters are often extremely forgettable because they usually have no bearing on the main plot and exist just to be a token love interest. Which leads me to the third option, have two of the main cast fall in love with each other. From a narrative standpoint, the latter is more interesting than inventing or upgrading a love interest, because it's a relationship between main characters who are going to continue to remain relevant and be a part of the main action, and who the audience is already more likely to become invested in because there's more time spent with them. So yeah, the magical girl genre does have at least a slight natural inclination towards queer narratives, because it usually focuses on same-sex characters. But the most important factor by far has to be because the core themes of the magical girl genre overlap with the queer experience. If we examine the core aspects that pop up in the magical girl genre, it's pretty easy to see how one could interpret these themes as a metaphor for the queer experience. While there isn't a set age for being a magical girl, and they can be anywhere from 10 to 18 years old, most magical girls center on the early to mid-teen years because this age marks the transitional period where you're in a sort of limbo of being not really a child, but not really an adult yet either. You're starting to face more responsibility while lacking a lot less of the freedoms. Going through the process of puberty marks a physical change on the body, and with that change comes self-discovery and the exploration of one's identity and expression of that identity. In the case of magical girls, that is often a secret identity. One they often feel they must keep hidden from their family due to the fear of the consequences of being outed. They lead a double life as a normal girl by day and sneak out at night to deal with problems other people their age don't have to deal with. In this way, magical girls are othered, becoming literally not like other girls often due to factors that are beyond their control. Often, in the beginning, a magical girl will have a couple of normal friends, but over time will start to become closer with their fellow magical girls. This is because the bond between magical girls is created from their shared identity, goals, and interests. It creates a different level of intimacy knowing that a friend not only knows exactly what you're going through, but will also have your back no matter what. The teen years are also when many people try dating for the first time, and with dating and romantic interest comes the turbulent period of first loves and all that that includes, such as unrequited love and panic. Magical girls will often have a crush on someone who they want to be with, but feel like they can't confess because they'll be rejected due to this core part of their identity. Now, obviously, being a magical pink cat girl isn't exactly the same as being a closeted gay 13-year-old, but these are the same feelings and experiences that many closeted queer people go through. The fear of being outed, of rejection or alienation after coming out, having to be on eggshells and constantly hide a part of their identity from the people who are supposed to unconditionally love and care for them and finding new strengths and a place of belonging from people who have similar experiences and a shared identity. The outcome is definitely different, but the root is the same. So it's clear to say that there is potential here, but this didn't pop up from nowhere. There had to be something that started this trend, right? To figure out the answer to this question, we'll have to rewind and take a look back all the way to the 1990s. I'll be the first to admit that part of me does feel a little repetitive when talking about magical girls because I always inevitably return to talking about Sailor Moon, but you have to understand that if I didn't, it would be like writing an essay on important superheroes and then not mentioning Superman. Like, it's impossible, the two are inextricably linked. Because, like it or not, Sailor Moon's success in one way or another has shaped the landscape of the magical girl genre for the last 30 years. Sailor Moon wasn't the first magical girl anime to exist, but its smash success made magical girls extremely lucrative and brought the genre into the mainstream. And one of the ways that it did this was by establishing several key elements that previous magical girl series lacked. One being the shift from solo magical girls into team units and putting the focus almost entirely on girls, their relationships, problems, and goals. The reclamation of feminine interests and values as a source of power and strength and not a weakness. And lastly, the inclusion of queerness. 
The 90s anime made some changes from the manga and created or edited several examples of queer characters over the course of the series, like making Kunzai and Zoisite lovers, Fish Eye's whole deal, and changing the Starlights from cross-dressing women into being magically gender fluid. But the most important inclusion from the manga and anime was the relationship between Sailor Uranus and Neptune, because it was the first positive portrayal of a lesbian relationship in a mainstream manga or anime ever. <laughs> positive representation being the key word here. Up until this point, and actually for a while after, most gay and lesbian characters would either be played for comedy or as sexual predators, or sometimes both. Earlier instances of even accidental queerness, like in 1983's episode of Urusei Yatsura, which has two girls going on a date due to a wacky misunderstanding, makes a point to mention several times how this is a very, very bad wrong thing and the importance of straightening out these characters and putting them back on the right path. Remember, this was at a time when the yuri genre, which is the term for Japanese media that broadly covers stories about the relationships between women and girls' love, was still in its infancy. During the 1970s and 80s, most yuri works often had tragic endings, wherein even if characters were in a romantic relationship, they ultimately ended up dying or permanently separated. But by the 90s, tragic narratives had declined, and one of the reasons for this was Sailor Moon's influence on the yuri genre itself. Sailor Moon wasn't created as a yuri work, but it has since then been claimed as one by the yuri community. While the Sailor Moon manga does unfortunately lean into some of these stereotypes, like the predatory lesbian by having Uranus kiss Sailor Moon without her consent, which I should mention the 1990s anime removed only for Crystal to put it back in 2016, which kind of feels like it's one step forward and two steps back. But overall, it was different from previous depictions of lesbian characters because this wasn't a one-off instance or a misunderstanding played for comedy or a character written in only to be immediately disposed of. Uranus and Neptune are main characters and Sailor Moon S is, for the most part, their arc. They are introduced as antagonists, which at the time was standard for queer characters, but ultimately they become allies with Sailor Moon. At the end of Sailor Moon S, not only do they survive, not only are they still together, they leave to raise their new adopted daughter together. Sailor Moon came out at the perfect time due to the changing cultural climate about gay rights in the 90s, and its immense popularity more or less opened the door for positive depictions of women loving women in mainstream anime and the magical girl genre. And its effects can be seen on several other notable anime that were more or less created in direct responses to Sailor Moon, such as... The manga for Cardcaptor Sakura was created by Clamp shortly before finishing their work on Magic Knight's Ray Earth and is overall very gay. It's notable for the best friend character, Tomio, having a one-sided, unrequited love for Sakura. Because Tomio knows that Sakura doesn't love her in the same way, she decides to put Sakura's happiness above her own and is content to remain as best friends. Her love for Sakura is completely selfless. Sakura's happiness is her happiness. One year later, in 1997, Revolutionary Girl Utena would be directed by Kunihiko Ikuhara, a former director on Sailor Moon, particularly Sailor Moon R the movie and the fourth season, Sailor Moon S, which introduces Uranus and Neptune. The third Sailor Moon film, Sailor Moon Supers, was originally going to be directed by Ikuhara, and would have featured the first appearance of Uranus and Neptune as the main characters in a standalone story independent from the TV series. However, Ikuhara was unsatisfied by the limitations of the source material and wanted to push the series further. And in 1996, he left directing Sailor Moon to start his own group, B Papas, where he eventually created Utena. Utena is more or less what Ikuhara wished he could do with Sailor Moon, but never could, such as straight up killing the prince. And several of the unused concepts for the plot of the Supers film, such as Neptune being in a 1000 year deep sleep at the end of the world and a chase scene on flying horses, were repurposed instead into Utena. Revolutionary Girl Utena is also extremely gay, with student council member Juri Arisugawa having a semi-unrequited love for Shiori. But it's most notable for the relationship between protagonists Utena and Anthe. While it is complicated and the series is about much more than just romance, 
As the story unfolds, they become closer and closer until by the end they have slowly fallen in love with one another over the course of the entire series. While the anime is less explicit and could be seen as falling into the tragic Yuri tropes from the 70s and 80s, I do interpret the anime's ending as positive, and the follow-up film Adolescence of Utena is much more explicit and overtly hopeful in its execution. By the late 90s, there had been a major increase in Magical Girl series being produced, which has only started to decline in recent years. And with that, a pattern emerged of the repeated inclusion of sapphic themes and lesbian characters. Now, I will be the first to admit that these series are not created equally. Not all of these are necessarily good or positive examples of lesbian representation, and that has to do with how lesbian media is produced and consumed, especially in Japan. Lesbian representation has a myriad of problems in the way it's depicted in media for a lot of complicated interconnected reasons, and this is going to be a lot to cover, so just bear with me for a bit. On one end of the spectrum, there's the hypersexual objectification and fetishizing of lesbians for the male gaze. And then on the other end is lesbian purity, where their love is just too pure and innocent for this sinful world. So these depictions are reductive, to say the least. Murder lesbians and ace lesbians are both fantastic, and I love them both. But when that's the majority of, and largely the only acceptable way lesbian characters are ever written, not only is that unrealistic, it's harmful stereotyping. Now here's the thing. The Yuri genre, unlike its opposite Yaoi, which is media about gay men, but is mostly made by and for the consumption of women, and is separate from Bara, which is mostly made by and for gay men. Yuri doesn't have any definitive separation between stories made by women and those made by men. Even though, generally speaking, they can be split into distinct subcategories based on their target demographic of either shoujo, josei, shonen, and seinen, respectively speaking, girls, women, boys, and men. Shoujo Yuri tends to focus on fairy tale inspired narratives that idolize Takarazuka review inspired girl prince characters. Josei Yuri usually portrays Safa couples that are grounded in a firmer sense of reality and realism. And lastly, Shonen and Seinen Yuri will either often depict relationships between innocent schoolgirls and predatory lesbians. Usually you can tell at a glance which is which, but not always. And the fact that they're all classed under the same umbrella term as Yuri, and there is no real separation between them, is kind of annoying. Like, for instance, if you're perusing through the genre, on the same shelf you may find mixed together My Lesbian Experience with Loneliness, an autobiographical Jose manga, Sweet Blue Flowers, Yuru Yuri, Other Side Picnic, or something like Chirality. So, I actually ground through the Wikipedia listing of definitive Yuri works to try and figure out how they were split demographic-wise. And on that list of 91 titles, along with two other titles I didn't include because they were multi-classed, 36 didn't have a listed demographic, Seinen accounted for 28, Shonen 12, Shoujo 9, and Jose 4. And if you remove the 36 that aren't classed as any demographic, Seinen makes up over half that list. Now, to be clear, this is a very small pool of numbers that I'm pulling from, and I'm sure that in a larger, more comprehensive study, those percentages would absolutely be different. And at the end of the day, I can only speak for myself. But... It can be extremely frustrating to be a queer woman looking for works about and made by other queer women, only to have the majority of works in that space be taken up by men making works fetishizing queer women. I'm not saying that you can only like what your target demographic is or that only men can write and consume seinen. Some of my favorite anime, period, are Yuri titles like Bloom Into You, which is a shonen manga written by a woman, and Revolutionary Girl Utena, a shoujo anime directed by a man. But it's because of all these extenuating factors that I can't say I'm really a fan of Yuri as a whole. And while that is annoying, in general, it bothers me a lot less than some of the other alternatives out there. What feels worse, to me at least, is when an author or company will pretend that they're going to include substantial LGBT representation while intending to never actually do so. In a word, queerbaiting. 
Queer baiting is a marketing technique used to hint at the inclusion of gay elements without actually committing to anything substantial. This allows writers to draw in queer audiences who are totally starved for mainstream representation without alienating conservative viewers. Writers may create enough textual evidence for a queer reading, but never anything explicit enough where the series can't maintain plausible deniability, and that won't totally fly over the heads of people who aren't as tuned into queer signals. For example, there's no way that I could possibly interpret Mint from the 2000 series Tokyo Mew Mew as anything other than a lesbian with a crush on her teammate Zakuro due to scenes like these. Which altogether seems like pretty substantial evidence of a romantic interest, and if they were a straight couple, this wouldn't even be up for debate. But just because I know in my heart that there's no heterosexual explanation for this, doesn't mean that the creators intended to write it that way. And one can make the argument that Mint isn't in love with Zakuro, she just idolizes her. This is how we get scenes that seem for all intents and purposes like an obvious declaration of love, yet are just ambiguous enough that they can somehow also be interpreted as just gals being pals. Couple that with the fact that the target demographic for Magical Girls is aimed at children and teens, and it crosses over into the homophobic idea that queer couples are inappropriate to show to children, because they are somehow inherently more sexual than straight characters doing exactly the same thing in the same shows. Which, from what I have gathered, might be the current state of the Madoka Magica series? Madoka Magica was a 2011 Magical Girl subversion, and the series is now currently ongoing through several film installations. Uh, you can skip ahead, like, a minute if you don't want spoilers for the end of the anime and Rebellion. In one of the last episodes, it is revealed that fellow magical girl Homura is actually a time traveler, and originally became a magical girl because she was saved by Madoka in an alternate timeline. And ever since then, she's been stuck in a time loop, reliving the same traumatizing events over and over again. Get up, attempt to save Madoka by changing the future, watch Madoka die, repeat. Get up, attempt to save Madoka by changing the future, watch Madoka die, repeat. We don't know exactly how long she's been doing this, but considering how much it's changed her, we can infer that it's been a while. And at this point, Homura is so worn down that saving specifically Madoka has become her only motivation to keep going. Any attempts to save her fellow magical girls are only because of how they relate back to Madoka. At the end, the only reason Madoka is able to become a god is because Homura made her the linchpin of all these alternate timelines because she kept rewinding time to save her. The consequences for Madoka becoming a god means that she's no longer even human, and no one, not even her family, can remember her, except for Homura. The existence of Madoka Kaname as we knew her may be gone, but because of her, magical girls will no longer turn into monstrous witches that kill people if they lose hope and give into despair. And all things considered, everyone more or less accepted this as the happiest ending we could get from such a dark series. Or at least we thought it was, until the 2013 film, appropriately named Rebellion, directly continued the anime's storyline. In a shocking twist, the film ended with Homura overthrowing Madoka. Homura forcibly rips away Madoka's godhood and ends up taking it for herself. And in doing so, this turns her into the actual devil. So that was like a lot for the last 10 minutes of that film. Homura then goes on to explain that her reason for doing this was because of her feelings for Madoka. A feeling that no one else in this world could possibly understand. Love. In a small poll of about 2,000 people on Best Yuri Anime from 1989 to 2019, Madoka Magica was ranked at number one at 231 votes, beating out Revolutionary Girl Utena by a scanty 30 votes. So it's generally agreed that Madoka Magica is pretty gay. Except that it might not be. In an interview with the head writer Gen Urobuchi, when asked outright, is Homura in love with Madoka? 
His response was, probably. And when prodded further with a follow-up question, why did you choose to portray a homosexual love, he went on to clarify that, I don't think it is that special. A really strong friendship turns into a love-like relationship without the sexual attraction in their case. And it's like, what does that mean? Homer uses Ayo to describe her feelings for Madoka, one of the strongest ways to declare your love for someone in Japanese. What do you mean, probably? I have been waiting for this follow-up film to Rebellion, Walpurg is knocked rising for almost a decade. I don't even know where to begin with this. Is Urobuchi just trolling and being vague on purpose? Is this a reference to Class S literature from the 1930s, a kind of proto yuri that specifically portrayed lesbian attachments as a platonic phase that one would naturally grow out of after graduating from school? Is this a translation issue because the original question was asked in German? English has a lot of different words and umbrella terms like queer and gay and sapphic that encompass a lot of different specific orientations and identities other than the clinical definition of homosexual. But a lot of Japan's words for gay people are English loanwords, including the term for lesbian. But the perceptions of lesbians in Japan are unfortunately associated with the hypersexual depictions in Yuri. So maybe it's because the word being used is homosexual. That could possibly explain Urobuchi's hedging response and why he felt the need to clarify that their relationship wasn't sexual. But in a 1996 interview with Naoko Takaguchi from an Italian magazine, which, uh, I will be clear, I don't have a credible source for. The magazine does exist and Sailor Moon is on the cover, but I can't verify its contents other than like one person's blog post. But I'm using this example because, allegedly, Takeguchi uses extremely similar wording to Urobuchi, but in her case she clarifies that it is special and it is a homosexual love instead of countering it. So I don't know. Is this the difference in attitudes towards Yuri culture being a new thing in the 90s versus Yuri culture in 2013, which has these connotations of being hypersexual? Is this just straight up queer baiting? It feels like queer baiting. But then, with that in mind, if we look back at this list of sapphic magical girl anime from the 2000s and 2010s, a lot of them could be interpreted as just bosom buddies because it's just plausible enough. The only two entries on this list that are 100% confirmed gay are Flip Flappers and Yurikuma Arashi, which, you guessed it, is directed by my man Kunihiko Ikuhara and is literally a critique of the depictions of both predatory lesbians and the tropes established by Class S literature. This is why explicit queer representation is so important, and why token representation, like the myriad of Disney's first gay characters, are so incredibly frustrating for gay people. Because unlike straight characters, where all you have to do is show them looking deeply into each other's eyes for a few seconds to convince the audience that they're in love, queer characters are stuck in this realm of plausible deniability until explicitly shown otherwise. Like, I can pick up on the queer subtext in Luca from a mile away because I'm already tuned into it and I'm starving for representation, but some people will never see it unless it's stated very clearly. And if the representation is so insignificant it can be edited out of the story without losing anything, well, there you go. It's so insignificant it doesn't mean anything. I'm not saying there's no room for nuance and subtle writing in gay romances, but if you don't include it explicitly, you're leaving the door open for people to say that it isn't there at all. But, alright. Remember what happened with Sailor Moon? Sailor Moon wouldn't be classified as Yuri from a Western perspective, but it has been claimed by Yuri fans because it had enough substantial lesbian themes that it resonated with them. And coming at it from that perspective, if there is enough of a queer reading on Madoka Magica, and trust me, there is. The last episode has them tenderly embracing while naked in space. It's not exactly subtle. Then, authorial intent or not, it can still be a Yuri work if it has been claimed by the Yuri community. And oh boy, has it. So if this is a case of Schrodinger's gay, and the most concrete answer to a character being gay from the word of God is probably, then it is equally plausible to say that they are definitely gay until explicitly proven otherwise. 
I don't know, it just it feels really disingenuous to praise Madoka Magica as being one of the best Yuri works of the century when the authors are still hedging about whether or not it's even actually gay. Like, y'all understand why that sucks, right? Right now, the series is currently still ongoing, so who knows, it might turn out alright. But it's just a lot of talk about gal pals from the head writer for me to be very hopeful. I know it probably seems silly to be this worked up about whether two fictional characters are in love or not, but for better or worse, like Uranus and Neptune, Homura and Monica's relationship is probably going to affect the way that the rest of sapphic romances are portrayed in Magical Girl anime for a while. Because this franchise has already significantly altered the landscape of the Magical Girl genre entirely. Nina Morales actually goes a bit more in-depth into this issue in their article, The Metamorphosis of the Magical Girl Genre, and explains in detail that while the genre was mostly feminist and female empowerment driven, since Madoka Magica's success, a lot of series being produced have been more or less a jaunty exercise in misery and suffering for their female characters. And thank god someone else took the time to put it into words because I knew I hadn't been vibing with a lot of new Magical Girl anime, but I couldn't put my finger on why. So whether the series continues to treat Madoka and Homura as the ambiguously gay duo, or decides to own its queer themes with pride, for now, only time will tell. While anime has sort of failed to live up to the expectations set by the previous generation, Recently, there's been a huge surge in Western magical girl media made by people who either grew up on or were influenced by Sailor Moon and revolutionary girl Utena, such as Steven Universe, She-Ra, and The Owl House. And they are, shockingly, very gay and monumentally important for LGBT representation, and overall have been much more progressive than anything similar being produced in Japan. So that's the current state of gay magical girls and how it happened. Sailor Moon did it, if not first, the loudest and with the most shockwaves, and ended up having a major influence on both the magical girl and Yuri genre. Because Sailor Moon was something that I grew up with, its existence was something that I kind of just always took for granted. Like, I knew that it was a big deal, but I definitely lacked the context as to why it was. So uh, yeah, I just think that's neat. And if you've actually made it all the way through this video, wow, thanks. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm absolutely sure that there's stuff I missed or wasn't able to get around to, but if the goal of these videos were to be a totally comprehensive experience, they would never end, and I need to sleep right now. These essay type videos require a lot more research and editing and just way more time put into them. And because of the support of my absolutely amazing patrons, I'm able to put the extra time I need into these videos and get them up to a standard that not only I'm pleased with, but I also think that you'll enjoy. So I'd like to give a big thank you to my patrons. This video was made possible because of you. And a warm welcome to my new patrons. Emily Sampson. Robert Daffin. Kyger. Braither. Not a Cylon. Ruler of the Clouds and Shy Anon C. Thank you so much. All right, I'm sending out, and I just want to let you know that everything is going to be okay.